received his medical degree from Aristotle University Medical School and his PhD from Athens Medical School in Greece. He completed a residency in surgery at New York Medical College and a residency in cardiothoracic surgery at Yale School of Medicine. He went on to complete fellowships in vascular and endovascular surgery at Arizona Heart Institute in Stony Brook Medicine. After working for a time at Brookhaven Memorial Hospital, known as Long Island Community Hospital, Dr. Coolius joined the faculty at Stony Brook Medicine as a vascular surgeon and assistant professor of surgery, as well as on staff at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital almost seven years now. Dr. Coolius' areas of expertise are the entire spectrum of vascular disease including erratic aneurysms and dissections, cardiotid artery disease for stroke prevention, and invasive treatment of venous disease and hemodialysis access. He is the co-director of the Wound Care Center here at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital and specializes in wound management. In addition, he is the director of the, the limb Preservation Center, and this is just a mention for a few areas. His research interests cover the mechanical properties of the erratic wall and erratic aneurysms, biochemical changes of the erratic well-being to erratic aneurysm formation, and ways to minimize lack of blood supply complications after acute arterial anthesema. Dr. Coolius speaks English, German, and Greek, and on a personal note, is married and has two children. Welcome, Dr. Coolius. Can you, can you guys hear me? All, all good? Okay, yeah. Okay, I may, I may do that. Can you guys hear me? Okay, much better. So thanks, everybody, for spending part of the afternoon with us. Um, I... Uh, I love this place. I've been here a couple of times the last four or five years uh, for presentations that have to do with vascular health. And um, I, uh, I have to say, this is a full house. We did not have such good attendance, uh, I think a year or two before the, uh, the pandemic. So I want to personally thank everybody for spending part of their afternoon with us. The, the topic of this presentation is uh, how to be smart with our vascular health, how to uh, make sure that we know the basics about vascular health and um, what can go wrong with our vascular system in different parts of the body, in our head, in our belly, in our extremities, and uh, what to uh, expect uh, and when to be proactive and how to avoid things from happening and, um, and how, to, uh, how and when to seek help um, at the end, we also would like to present uh, you and the other residents of this wonderful facility with an opportunity to actively check their vascular status with um, uh, screenings, which is a, basically a very uh, fast uh, vascular examination of basic vascular diseases that Stony Brook Vascular Surgery offers um, for free uh, after, of course, the patients uh, uh, register. And I think it's going to be provided right here in Peconic Landing. So we, uh, uh, we wanted to go over a few subjects. I'm not gonna be very medical because I want you guys to, uh, I don't want you guys to fall asleep uh, because it's a nice atmosphere in the early afternoon but I would like to um, go over a few things that uh, all of us should know um, about our body and our vascular system. So um, uh, we will check and we'll together discuss about what are abdominal aneurysms, what are the symptoms of stroke, uh, and uh, some entities that look like stroke and we can see it in our friends and immediately recognize them and uh, help them by calling the you know, for help. Uh, what are the symptoms of peripheral arterial disease, meaning 
when we walk and we have pain and um, uh, what to do in these cases. And also, what can we do um, to reduce our risk factors, meaning the things that can uh, we can modify in our lifestyle uh, so we don't get vascular disease. So um, briefly speaking, abdominal aortic aneurysms um, are um, is a ballooning of the aorta, meaning the um, uh, main artery of the body, uh, instead of being a cylinder, it assumes a configuration then that the main part of the aorta becomes dilated. So this is gradual. The majority of times is asymptomatic, meaning we don't even know that this is happening. And although we know that um, the number one by far reason uh, to have that is related to our past history of smoking, there is a lot of people that um, we don't really know why they had the aneurysms. A small percentage of those patients uh, had aneurysms in their family, or they know that their parents and grandparents in the past uh, have heard the word aneurysms in the family, but still the way things are transmitted from generation to generation when it comes to aneurysms are still not known to us today. So um, um, uh, I don't wanna start with numbers for how bad aneurysms are and how many people die and how many people don't make it, I just want to pass the message that aneurysms is something that we can do a very easy test. It's called an abdominal ultrasound, and we know in, immediately if we have it or we don't have it. And if we have it today, um, we are very treatable uh, in the vast majority of patients. More than 90, 96, 97% of patients can have effective treatment. So, um, uh, it's predominantly a male disease, so more male patients after the age of 65 will end up having this diagnosis, but also um, some, some, some females can also have this uh, problem. I have to say that the majority of people that we see this disease fit a profile of a male patient with high blood pressure and an extensive history of past smoking. And uh, I know that the generations before me and your generations, as well as your parents' generations, um, smoking was endemic. Everybody was smoking. Kids were smoking in Greece. Even when I was I'm now 52 years old and when I was in elementary school, kids were smoking. And uh, the parents were smoking with the kids in the same room. Teachers in the elementary school were smoking. Doctors were smoking in the hospital. So everybody was smoking. So unfortunately, those generations have a higher risk of having an abdominal aneurysm. So uh, what is the thing that can um, show us that we may have an aneurysm? That is a slide that I was thinking of presenting or not presenting because I don't want to send the wrong message to you guys. Uh, the majority of aneurysms have no symptoms. Now, if the aneurysms are large and we don't know them, then in case they rupture or they crack, they don't necessarily rupture um, freely, meaning with a big opening in the abdominal, in the aortic wall, but they may be leaking, then we have new onset abdominal or lower back pain, something that uh, a lot of people in this age range will have back pain, but all our patients will know that this back pain is something new, it does not resemble the usual back pain from the lumbar spine, is something that they immediately identify as new, intense, and that they never had it before. This um, is something very, um, not very frequent, but if we have symptoms with aneurysms, again, it's going to be uh, new onset in intense lower back pain or lower abdominal pain that the patient knows that they never had before. In this case, I think we need to call 911 and the ambulance right away because we may need to have uh, emergent uh, medical help. 
So, uh, again, I don't want to go over very technical things. I just want to give the message that we can treat those aneurysms today very effectively uh, by not cutting the patient open as it was up to maybe 10, 15 years ago, but the majority of patients can be treated with wires, balloons, and stents from small needle holes from both groins. And believe it or not, they go home after breakfast the next day. I, if I, uh, as I said, I'm 52 years old. If somebody was telling me when I was in medical school that abdominal aortic aneurysm patients would eat breakfast the next day and go home about their business, I would never, never, never believe it. But it's true. All my patients and all our patients generally go home the next day um, walking and essentially asymptomatic. So I'm saying that because I would like just for you guys to know that if it's something like that happens and we identify it, we will, uh, we usually treat it very, very effectively. So another subject that I wanted to draw your attention is carotid disease. Carotid disease is basically blockage at the carotid arteries, which are the arteries that are on the left and the right side of our neck. And um, I, I kind of, I think everybody, doctor or no doctor or health provider knows what carotids are. Uh, these are the arteries that bring blood to our uh, brain. And um, of course, uh, blockage in those arteries is associated with um, uh, sometimes uh, small particles departing from that plaque and they flicker off and they go up in the head. If something um, breaks from that plaque, there is no other location for this particle to go except the brain. The brain is the cul de sac, so to speak, of the circulation. So if something happens at the road to that cul de sac, guess what? It will go at the end of the cul-de-sac, which is usually our uh, brain. And what can happen in these cases? Uh, we, again, I don't want to go into numbers and make everybody uh, um, shaking at the end of the presentation and be worried, but we can have a stroke, which is basically a part of the brain acutely does not receive oxygen and uh, or bleeds, and that usually manifests as something that pretty much all of us have seen between friends of ours or colleagues or we've seen on TV. We have an acute change in our mental status or we acutely we cannot find the right words to speak or our partner or wife, husband, um, they see that something is wrong with us. We cannot find the right way to talk or we cannot talk at all or our mouth um, uh, our mouth or jaw angle drops or one arm or one leg doesn't feel good or drops, doesn't have any muscular strength or it's numb. So acute numbness or acute change in strength of our extremities, either upper extremities or lower extremities, or changing in speech and mental status, that all of them are not gradual, they don't last for days, but they're acute and they're witnessed. These are all indications that something may be going on with the carotid arteries or we're having a stroke. This is something more common, so to speak, than the abdominal aneurysm we discussed before. The abdominal aneurysms are more rare. Stroke is uh, unfortunately something very common is one of the most common reasons to have a big cardiovascular problem after the age of 65. So again, we have, as we said, changes in the face angle, our arms drop, we cannot find the right way, the right words, uh, of course, uh, either us uh, or somebody that witnesses us will have to call for uh, emergency medical assistance. So again, you can see here, it's something a little bit more um, uh, graphic, so to speak. We see that plaque, which is in the artery that goes to the head. So if that black, um, 
something, a small piece comes off that plaque, it will go to their head. And somebody will say, well, how can I know that I have a plaque? We can, again, find that with a very simple ultrasound. And somebody can ask, well, what is that plaque? Well, that plaque is either cholesterol or calcium and byproducts of smoking over the years. So again, we go back to our chronic smoking history and also back to what we call, um, I don't want to, um, uh, what we call Western diet, uh, which is something of course that all of us like, but can hurt us uh, in the long term if we consume large quantities of animal fat, anything that has four legs can hurt us uh, if we consume it in large quantities. So despite that it could be delicious, it also over the course of the years, it could be um, a little bit hurtful. So we have this accumulation of, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to show you something again in that plaque. We have this accumulation of this material inside the artery. This is normal without any accumulation of cholesterol. And this is abnormal. And if something breaks, it will go up in the head. And somebody can ask, well, how, uh, why does it break? Well, it breaks, let's say, for example, we are doing something um, strenuous. Let's say somebody says, oh, um, you know, I go to the supermarket, take two or three bags of groceries, put them in the trunk. And suddenly our pressure, instead of being 140 or 130, now it goes to 140. 80 or 90, which is something that is normal. It's normal to have ups and downs in our blood pressure with physical activity. Uh, if we have that plaque and we have um, blood pressure rate, uh, uh, abrupt blood pressure rises, something can uh, you know, break and go up. So uh, the smarter way to go about this is uh, to have an ultrasound, make sure that we don't have it, or if we have it, we have today, powerful medications. Again, those medications have been developed the last two decades at the latest, um, no more than 20 years, I would say, and they actually stop or decelerate uh, significantly the piling up of cholesterol in that plaque. A lot of people sometimes ask, uh, ask us in our presentations if actually uh, those medications remove the cholesterol and they make things better. And unfortunately, the truth today is that they don't make it better. They cannot clean up, so to speak, the plaque. The plaque will always be there, but it will not get any worse. So that is something also that we would like to know if we have it or, or not. Um, so, and uh, we have many ways of fixing it. Um, we can, uh, clean up that artery or put a stent on it. I don't want to get more technical, but our division of vascular surgery does a lot of these procedures every year uh, with very excellent results. And uh, we basically remove that plaque. Uh, of course, that needs to be done at the hospital or we put a stent and we mechanically, forcefully, push that plaque on the side and we open up the artery. So um, again, something to have in mind, um, uh, if you would like to check it, uh, and again, it's something that you don't need to be checking it every three, six months, it's a one-time check. And they're based on, based on the results of that ultrasound, we either watch it or we, um, uh, we can check it once a year. If it's something more, we can check it, of course, a little bit more frequently. Generally speaking, nothing needs to be operated unless it is more than 75 and today 80% blocking the artery. So the majority of people, more than 90% of people, don't have 80% blockage. So they have much less. So the news actually are not so bad but we just need to know that we have it so we can get appropriately treated. The other thing that I wanted to go over it with you guys is what we call today peripheral arterial disease. This is to make it very simple. 
the same thing that we see in the carotid arteries, meaning piling up of cholesterol, tobacco products, or calcium, but not at the carotid artery, but in the arteries of the legs. So we walk and we usually have either calf pain or uh, thigh pain. 90% of people will have some form of calf pain. Uh, the thing is with this is that as soon as we stop, that pain miraculously goes away. And 30 seconds later, we are good to go again, again to have calf pain or uh, pain in the muscles that forces us to stop a few yards later. So why is that? Is because the arteries that feed the muscles on our legs have blockage from this material, the same material and the same process that we saw in the carotid artery. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of famous people have had extensive carotid, uh, sorry, peripheral arterial disease, meaning had blockages in their legs. Uh, I, I had also a lot of famous people with aneurysms and a lot of famous people with carotids. I just didn't want to have a slide with, you know, 20 famous people that expired because of problems, because then you, you wouldn't like me so much today. Uh, so if you see that, you will see that um, we have a narrowing of one artery that goes to the leg. It could be one narrowing. We have many patients that have um, three, four, five, or six narrowings. During the course of the extremity artery, they can have a narrowing at the, gro at the groin, a narrowing up behind the knee, another na uh, narrowing in the ankle, in the foot, and sometimes in the toe arteries. So it depends on where this calcium and where this cholesterol and is being deposited over the years. Uh, this, believe it or not, is a benign problem and not cause so frequently um, catastrophic complications as carotid artery or abdominal aortic aneurysms. The majority of people have what we call claudication, which is pain with walking. From these people, the books say that 90% will never have any problem if they take their medications and they walk. If we are couch potatoes and we like watching, um, you know, uh, let's say TV or movies and no walk around, we will pay for it. And I keep saying that to myself because many times I get myself, you know, being um, completely unmotivated to walk or exercise. The bottom line is that if we walk, very rarely we have significant arterial disease in the legs. Uh, so any of us that is lazy, and I say that also including me, we better start walking and go out and have a regular walking schedule that will keep those arteries open from piling up cholesterol, lipids, uh, calcium, or other uh, products uh, that actually unfortunately um, uh, pile up there. We have also very effective treatments if walking is not enough, we have medications. We also have treatments like the ones that I mentioned before for the carotid artery. We have people that, um, 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 you see the blockages here. We can use stents, we can use balloons. We do that in everyday practice in vascular surgery. We have, um, special devices that go in uh, we call you know i would say the word rotor rooters which is something that probably people will identify more with uh, it's not very scientific from a vascular standpoint but it's a device that removes that intravascular material and restores continuity of that cylinder you see here that this cylinder right on your right side has a big blockage so if you want to go with your spouse or your husband for a big walk and you have to go up and down a hill or something, you may not have enough oxygen to give to your muscles to walk because this here is blocking, right? The blood supply to go down the leg. Uh, we can rotor root that. We can 
stent it with can balloon it and we can make it a nice normal cylinder as it is on the left side of this um, picture and then now we have much more blood flow to go down and we can walk with no symptoms uh, everything is related as uh, to the supply and demand of oxygen during an activity if we have enough oxygen we don't have pain if we do not have enough oxygen and we need more for what we're doing then we will have muscular pain this is our body's way of saying you need more oxygen i'm starving here do something to make me better so uh, and then you can see here this is a little uh, uh, picture which i love because it shows how usually we have an almost open artery something starts piling up here we keep smoking right we keep eating those porterhouse steaks uh, we keep eating those uh, double cheeseburgers uh, we keep smoking cigars cigarettes and 30 40 years later we're here so unfortunately um, this is something that uh, uh, will produce will produce symptoms the symptoms depending on where on the body that artery is uh, would be either a stroke, could be either a chest pain if it's in the heart, could be either uh, leg pain with walking if it's in the legs. Again, I don't want you guys to live here thinking that um, you probably have something lethal and you don't know because the reality is that all of that stuff is highly treatable very easily detectable and we have multiple medical and multiple surgical options the majority of our patients do not need the procedure they just need what we call lifestyle modification meaning right medications changes in our diet and being a little bit more um, mobile and with that I don't want to show you the um, the bad things that can happen. Uh, you know, another thing that I want to mention because we have special expertise um, in our division of vascular surgery is that when we don't have uh, oxygen, things can happen that did not happen to us when we had oxygen. Like, for example, we get out of the car and we hit our foot in the car door or we hit our foot, you know, on a table and stop and shop or in the supermarket and you get a scratch. And, um, you know, that scratch, you would not pay attention to that 20, 30 years ago. And now that scratch stays there. It doesn't get any, it doesn't heal or it becomes uh, more of a problem. It gets infected. Then now out of nowhere, two weeks later, you have a small um, bruise or you have a small uh, wound that uh, you know you put bacitration or you put you go to a doctor the doctor says no problem it will be away but these things don't go away that is another way for us to know that we may need more oxygen because we don't have the oxygen to go there and heal this wound um, i have an extensive practice of healing wounds um, that have um, uh, less oxygen than they need and uh, it's one of my personal um, favorites so to speak to try to heal patients that have um, extremity wounds so they can get back and um, and walk with uh, safety so um, um, I want to go through those slides um, uh, this is also something that I don't want to pay too much attention, but since we all of, offer that screening that we discussed at the beginning of our presentation, I wanted to show you that screening, meaning how to find out if we have any blockages, it's very easy. You just, uh, it's called non-invasive vascular testing, meaning it's essentially an ultrasound and taking some blood pressures from the extremities sometimes or the upper extremities the lower extremities and with simple uh, mathematics um, maybe seventh eighth ninth grade mathematics we can find out if we have 
vascular disease that needs more uh, testing. So you can see that basically the patient sits on a, uh, on a, uh, a chair and we just check the arteries with uh, the, the ultrasound. And from that, we can see uh, th uh, things inside the vascular system. Now, if we need to go into more detail, then unfortunately we'll have to go to the radiologist and have, I'm sure everybody has heard CAT scans, MRIs, and this and that, which of course we do them all the time, but it's something that is not for first line care, it's only if we really think that we have a real issue. So uh, you see those two girls there on the bicycle, that's what everybody should be doing one way or the other. We have to stay mobile. If something comes out as a main message from our, um, conversation tonight is that we need to the maximum of our abilities to be mobile. We need to be moving around. We need to do exercising as much as the physician or our body allows us. Could be bicycle, could be some people cannot do certain things because they have arthritis or fractures or other stuff. But within the limits of our capabilities, we need to be active. This is the number one thing that we need to get as a message. Take our medications and be active as much as we can. I think that probably very few people here smoke, if any. Smoking is a thing of the past. We should not be smoking. N nicotine is actually, I didn't know that until maybe six months ago, when I read a, new, a, Wall, a Wall Street Journal article that nicotine is more addicting, is one of the most, if not the most addicting substance in nature. It's more addicting than heroin and more addicting than all the drugs that we, we know. It is addic very easily addictive and very difficult to get rid of our addiction. So, it is tough. I have a lot of respect, tremendous respect for people that stopped smoking. And I think one way or the other, we should not be using tobacco at the year 2023. It's not, we have so much data that tells us that it is bad that, you know, the pleasure factor, I think, should not be there anymore. We should not be touching uh, cigarettes or tobacco products. Uh, these are more specialized stuff. I wanted to tell you that we have multiple options to treat, um, uh, as I said, any blockages on the vascular system. I don't want to go over each and every one because we have for you printed copies of this presentation at the end. If you want to go and take them and you can eyeball those slides uh, and see them. So. Uh, you can just read all those things on um, in, in on your own pace. Uh, what I wanted to uh, again finishing to say that is we can check for those things. Uh, there is a pre -screen, pre screening process. Um, sometimes I don't know if Ali do we pre screen on the phone or we just get people that uh, yeah okay so we we have a process and. You guys are more than welcome at the end of the presentation to ask and inquire if you would like to check yourselves for, for a disease. Um, and with that being said, this is our group uh, and uh, on a sunny day. And uh, with that, we would like to thank you for your attention. We have uh, many locations. The one that we are really... Um, uh, uh, we, we started recently in Maritak and a Riverhead location, which are really close to you guys. We also have some other locations, as you can see, but um, a little bit more far from here. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would love to entertain any questions. Yes. Claudication is a very good question. Claudication is what we said when we have a blockage at the artery, we walk. At a certain point, our calf or our leg starts hurting. We can go a little further, but then the pain 
which is always muscular, meaning it's on the meat, it's not on the bone, it's not arthritis, forces us to stop. We have to stop and then one or two minutes later, the pain is gone and we can go further. But it's a repetitive thing. Majority of patients know that, let's say, 100 yards, 80 yards, the parking lot or my car, they know, or the mailbox, they know that they will get predictably pain in the calf or in the thigh on a specific distance. If that happens, that we need to check for any blockage in the arteries of that leg. It's basically an imbalance of oxygen. We need more oxygen to walk and we don't have it. Yes, sir. The answer is yes. It's, this is a more es esoteric question. I would love to say that this is correct. Dementia today is linked more to what we call microvascular disease, meaning in the head, the small vessels that are 1 30th or 1 40th of an inch in diameter, they get clogged with the same material, uh, which is cholesterol. And that is progressively diminishing our cognitive ability and memory. That is called vascular dementia. It's not treated, of course, with surgery because the vessels, are set, as I said, are tiny, but the mechanism for vascular dementia is very similar to what we described here. Relate to the slide, but uh, do you have uh uh authority for eastern long island hospital for some of your tests the Stony Brook system includes eastern long island hospital but we do not have a vascular service at eastern long island hospital we have vascular outpatient clinics very close to greenport uh, maritak and riverhead but we don't have a service with a vascular surgeon or a vascular provider at Eastern Long Island Hospital. No, we okay. don't have that. Thank you. Sir, I'm sorry. I'd like to know if you do any uh, surgery uh, on well-identified sites of peripheral artery disease in the limb, in the lower limbs, for instance. That is a very good question. And the answer is that we first see what we do, what we can do without surgery. We start some medications and uh, the number one initial way of treating it is to uh, walk. Walking increases what we call collateral circulation. What is collateral circulation is, yes, that tube that goes down to our calf is blocked, but the more we walk, and especially the more we walk with the pain, encourages our body to create additional vessels that bypass that blocked vessel. And believe it or not, there are people, some of them are runners or long distance walkers that have fully blocked arteries and they can walk miles because they have developed collateral circulation? That was a very good question. Is var varicosities uh, relevant to this discussion? Like varicose veins? Varicose veins is a subject of vascular surgery. It's not relevant to our conversation today when it comes to arterial disease. It has to do with uh, a progressive um, uh, deterioration, so to speak, of the vein of, of the walls of the venous system. It's a very common problem. It is by far uh, the most common vascular problem in humans. It is six to eight times more common than the things that we are talking today. We chose those subjects because those subjects are um, 
a little bit more serious if we neglect them. Uh, varicose veins also are serious, but they cannot usually harm us if we go to the physician uh, because they're very treatable. But varicosities are issues of the venous system. All our conversation today has to do with the arterial system. So the arteries bring blood from the heart to the legs or to the head, and they give oxygen so we can function. And the vein, the mission of the veins is to get that blood that now has no oxygen and bring it back to the heart and the lungs. So with our breathing, we can reoxygenate it, make it full of oxygen so it can go again as a continuous cycle back to our muscles, uh, kidneys, kidneys so we can produce urine, our liver, anywhere we need to go. Uh, so uh, again, venous disease is very important, but was not covered to this conversation. And we will be happy to cover it in the future because it's um, a widespread. You've referred to medications for uh, PAD. Uh, could you go through the month heard of cholesterol being the only one that was affected and it was limited at that was what a vascular surgeon has told me. Well, the um, medical management of those plaques that we saw, meaning those um, accumulations on the arterial wall has three main strategies. One, we call them antiplatelets, meaning we need to have, unless we have an active stomach ulcer, everybody that has a plaque should be on a medication that stops clots from forming onto that plaque. And then two most common medications for that are aspirin, that I think um, a lot of people are on, or another medication is called Plavix. The second category are medications to actually decrease our levels of cholesterol. And the third category of medications are the ones that, remember we had this conversation about up and down in, the, in blood pressure. So we need to be on an antihypertensive medication so we don't have high blood pressure. So everybody with a plaque, irrespective of the plaque location, if it is in the neck, in the kidney arteries, in the feet, in the thighs, anywhere, should be on those three categories of medications. Antiplatelets, cholesterol medications, and antihypertensives. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just a, a question on aspirin, the 80 millimeters that they say older people should take. There seems to be controversy. Some doctors say you don't need it and other doctors say you do need it. I know, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky question. I, uh, aspirin use has been validated by studies in the 70s, 80s and 90s with thousands of patients, hundreds of thousands of patients. We are not sure if 81 or 325 is, uh, has a difference. And the majority of doctors think that 81, what we call baby aspirin, is good. With that being said, newer studies of those people that were followed in the 80s and 90s, and now, of course, are a little older, question the benefit that the initial studies had shown. As of now, I am advising my parents in their 80s, unless they have a contraindication to be on a baby aspirin. So with that, I would like to address a few questions from our online audience. Um, um, the first one's question is, um, what does vascular health cover? I think uh, we covered that question overall with our presentation. Vascular health means to avoid piling up that cholesterol in the inside of our arteries. Uh, and then that, that was the main gist of this communication we had today, our presentation is try to avoid blocking those arteries. 
by just being active and um, checking yourself. And uh, if you have some piling up, just be on the right uh, form of medications. So another question is uh, how long for a blood clot to dissolve itself? That is, that's a good question. Uh, our body has its own thrombolytic system, meaning the body can dissolve clots on its own. The reality is although that if the clot is in a sensitive area, meaning an area that has high oxygen demands like the brain, by the time that our own system dissolves the clot, we will have irreparable and irreversible damage on the brain. So uh, I think that although uh, this question has merit and indeed in some parts our body can dissolve the clot, usually we need medical help to dissolve that clot much faster than our own abilities. So vitamin or supplement aids for vascular health. Okay, that is also a good subject. I think that a lot of people, um, and especially if we, um, you know, are on the internet and we're browsing, we see multiple ads about this and that and heart and this and vascular, and um, especially um, de dementia, memory. It's difficult to say yes to those substances and also difficult to say no. What I would suggest is that just make sure that they don't react with what you're taking. Um, they, for example, if you're taking a blood thinner, you can take a vitamin pill that can deactivate your blood thinner and then you can have a stroke. So do not take something unless you know that it doesn't um, react with your medications. That's number one. Number two, if it is something that um, appears to be, I would say, um, natural, and again, that's a word that I'm not sure if I should be using, but if it is something that is not man-made or is a plant extract, or if you have a lot of people uh, that take it, I think you should check it with your primary care doctor and uh, he will give you the okay usually to use it. It's good to have a balanced diet and get some more vitamins on board, but I don't think that there is any real substance in nature that can help us from what we presented today. I don't think so. Another question is, are child brains symptomatic of vascular disease? Okay, that's also a good question. The answer is yes and no. Vascular disease is when we, there are different types of vascular disease. 95% of vascular disease is what we presented today, meaning, uh, meaning that um, we have a blockage in the artery. So child brains is not exactly this. Child brains is just a inherent sensitivity of our vessels to clog but not to clog because there is cholesterol inside. They just, um, what we call vasoconstrict. That means that uh, the artery for multiple reasons, call it COVID, call it um, cold, uh, call it um, and other, and other, other viral infections, uh, 